Well, good morning. Good morning. <laughs> it's good to see you all here today. I don't know if it's a function of getting old, but um, I didn't even say anything yet. But worship was really special to me because it, uh, it just really touched my heart to think about how God loves us unconditionally. Amen. Amen. It's amazing because we do a lot of things in our condition that would make us unlovable. And God already knows everything that we're ever going to do, and he loves us anyway. He knows the depths of our heart. In a way that we can't know each other, God knows our hearts, and he loves us anyway. And I think that's amazing. It just uh, really made an impression on me. Thank you guys for worship this morning. It was really beautiful. Well, this morning we're back in the book of Genesis, and um, it's a short little section. I almost covered it last week. But I, I hate to, you know, wear out my welcome with you people. If you go over an hour, man, people are gone, you know. It's funny because TV kind of sets our appetites for a certain period of time. You can concentrate. And then, you know, like going to a Broadway play or you go somewhere, you watch a two-hour movie and you're like, I hate to wear you guys out. And the Word of God is so special and it deserves really prominence in our hearts, so I, I never want to just run through it, um, although I do some of that because I would just stay here forever in Genesis, but let's pray. Father, thank you so much for the opportunity to be here. What a freedom, what a joy, what a privilege it is to come into your presence, to know that you are here with us. You promised to be with us, and Lord, as we gather in your name, and not like some, but we, we come here to gather and there's an interaction that happens here, and it's a special time where you are present with us. You're with us in our worship, and now I pray, Lord, that you'd be with us in our learning, that you might mold us, our hearts and our minds. You know the places where we need the rough edges sanded off, where we need the crooked ways straightened, where there are saddened areas of our hearts that we need encouragement and strength and healing. And Lord, I pray that you would come and do all of that in us today. Have your way with us, Lord. Enlarge our hearts and focus our minds in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right. By the way, <laughs> this is a church word. A potluck. I've been looking for something, to, something else to call a potluck. So if any of you know something better, let me know after. Don't just shout it out now, you crazy people. <laughs> Potluck, used in reference to a situation in which one must take a chance in whatever is available. That's, that's what it means. That's the definition of it. It's like, it's like manna, you know? Right? Like, what is it? You don't know? Just take some because you'll offend somebody if you don't try it. So anyway, so we, we have a potluck coming up. So just anyway, last week... <laughs> we looked at the birth of Isaac. It was this long, long, long 25 years between God promising the coming of this son to two elderly parents. And I think God waited all the way until they had absolutely no hope and there was no way to the point where he, he made it happen. And it's kind of a foreshadowing of another birth, which we looked at last week. And so they finally, after 25 long years, laughter is born. Uh, Isaac means laughter. So if you want to name your kid Isaac, hopefully there'll be a comedian. That'll work out real well. But we see that Isaac was eight years old and he was circumcised, that he was born to Sarah and Abraham. And the day that it was weaned, had a big party and had everybody come in, but something happened because his plan B was there. His plan B is Ishmael, and Ishmael began teasing the young brother or half-brother, and Sarah got mad, not Sarah Palin, but Sarah got angry because of all the mess that was going on and said, this woman's got to go. She and her kid got to go, and it was kind of a willful thing, and if you remember, it was her idea. Hey, I'm too old. Why don't you try her? 
and suddenly we have Ishmael born, and now suddenly it doesn't look so good because the promise of God comes. It's always like that. When God actually fulfills his promise and it's exactly the way that he means it to be, anything else that we've done to try to substitute, we're just ashamed of. And that's what ends up happening. So he ends up sending them away because they were told to send away. He checks with God and God says, yeah, send them away because this was never his intention anyway. God never intended him to have a child through some other woman. It was never what God wanted in the beginning. His promise was about Isaac. All of the promises always hinged through Sarah, in which he kind of being a little soft on his faith decided, well, okay, maybe my wife's you know, right. Maybe God meant something else that he didn't mean. You ever get confused about what it is that the Lord speaks to you about? So I, you know, I'm not going to hammer him too hard because although I'm... You know, my wife is not going to introduce me to my next wife. That's never going to happen. <laughs> and so immediately Abraham rises and he basically banishes them and sends them off. And, and you think, this is a really cruel and unusual divorce. Or, you know, maybe she didn't have a good lawyer or whatever. But they weren't married. They were never officially married. Not before God. Not before witnesses. Not officiated by God. This was something he took upon himself. And not... Not every person that you decide to get into a relationship is a godly relationship. Trust me. Not every relationship that you get involved with is a good godly relationship. And you need to be very, very careful because when you get into relationships, there is there are consequences. And you have to live with those consequences for the rest of your life. And I understand this. So he sends them off and it seems cruel and unusual. We talked about what that is. You see, she and her son were a picture of the law and a picture of the flesh. And we see that in Galatians chapter 4. And we explained all that last week, so I don't want to go into it. But, you know, when, when God calls us to something higher, when he calls us to his promises, when he calls us to that which he has said is going to be, we have to forsake all else. Isn't that what Jesus calls us to? He says, unless you leave everything, your father and your mother and everything and follow me, you're not worthy to follow me. He who puts his hand to the plow and looks back is not worthy of me, Jesus says. It's everything or it's nothing. So we talked about that last week and about how Hagar goes out and God actually watches over her and provides for her and makes promises to her of how he's going to take care of her. And it's interesting, she puts her son underneath a bush and she goes about an arrow's throw away and says, I, I can't watch my son die. I just have to, I have to come over here. And, and she's crying out to God. And it's interesting. God answers his prayer. I just thought that was curious. Doesn't answer her prayer, answers his prayer. So apparently he's praying under a bush. He's learned some things being with Abraham, I think. And so God comes and he says, don't worry about it. The boy's fine and turns and she's able to see water and she understands that's what I'm supposed to do. So she goes over and gets the water, saves her son, and, and they go down, and he, she gets him a wife out of Egypt, and they end up having this whole family. In fact, there are 12 princes that come from Ishmael, and they're listed in the scriptures so we can find them. So God comes to the rescue for the person, although the picture that God intended is we need to put off acts of the flesh. We need to put off our own plan and divest ourselves and give our life for Christ because he gave his life for us, right? So this week, we're going to look at a little short 12 verses, which I, I hope to finish last week, but I didn't. And it's about Abimelech. You remember Abimelech or Abimelech, depending on how you want to pronounce it? Or you can put a little in there if you want. <laughs> Abimelech, he's the ruler over in Gerar. He's the king there. And Abram, when he came, or Abraham, when he came, said, oh, you, you like the woman who's with me? That's my sister. This is the second time he did this. And he lied about her, saying Sarah was his sister. And he goes, well, I'd like to get to know her a little better. Why don't you come in and move in with me, baby? And he takes her back to the palace. And Abraham, because of his lie, just lost his wife. And he has to explain that it's his wife for real, but actually the Lord comes to him in a dream before he's able to consummate anything. And he comes to Abraham and gets in his face. You remember that? He says, what were you thinking? And he gives a whole explanation, but he doesn't give a confession. And he doesn't take responsibility. He doesn't ask for forgiveness. 
He doesn't offer repentance. He doesn't do all of the things that you and I understand from the scriptures that we should do to rectify and to solidify a relationship. Well, it turns out that Isaac is born and it's a miracle. And as he's growing up, Abimelech sees all of this. Not only did God tell him, this is a prophet of mine and he'll pray for you and he'll answer your prayers, which he does. And suddenly his whole household uh, is able to reproduce where they weren't before. But he knows that this is a prophet of God. But you know what happens when somebody lies to you? You don't know, huh? Well, when someone lies to you, it's hard to trust them right? And uh, if you're like a really difficult, forgiving person like me, uh, you just don't trust a word that comes out of their mouth that you have to be corroborated by two or three witnesses, everything you say. I got to have accountability. I got to have something on paper. We got to sign a contract or whatever. It's very difficult if you have a heart that holds on to things to be able to trust people who have lied to you in the past. Now, Abimelech's going to actually come to Abraham and he's going to want to cut a deal with him. So let's take a look at it. Beginning in verse 22. And it came to pass at the time Abimelech and Phicol, the commander of his army, spoke to Abraham, saying, God is with you in all that you do. Now, therefore, swear to me by God that you will not deal falsely with me, for my offspring, with my offspring or with my posterity, but that according to the kindness that I have done to you, you will do to me and to the land in which you have dwelt. So Abimelech sees that God is with him. And over the course of time, he's seen that God's blessing him to the point where the dude's 100 years old and he has a child. That's an act of God right there. That's a miracle. It's a full-blown miracle. And Sarah's 90, and she pushed out Isaac. I have a hard, I have a hard time getting in bed and tying my shoes. 90 years old, pushing out a baby. And if you remember what happened last time, Abraham lied to him, flat out lied to him, got him in a pinch with God, and he said, you're a dead man. I'm going to kill you. I'm going to take your life out. And he says, well, I didn't do anything wrong in the innocence of my hands and of my heart. I did this thing. Uh, Would you destroy a righteous nation also? Because God just destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah in those cities. And so he understands that. And so he says, I I didn't do this. And God says, yeah, I know. I know you didn't do anything. You didn't put a a hand on her because I told you you weren't going to put a hand on her. I made it happen. Sometimes we think we're doing things when we see God superimposing his will. And so from our earthly point of view, we think we're doing all these things. And sometimes we feel like we should pat ourselves on the back or someone else should pat me on the back. But it's God causing all those things to will and to do for his good pleasure. So he had this conflict before, and now he says, listen, I need you to promise me, I need you to swear by the God that you know that you're not going to lie to me anymore. Wow. Can you imagine that? But what a great opportunity. This is a great opportunity to solidify a relationship that I think until now has been distant because he says, listen, go anywhere you want in my land, go anywhere you want, I don't care, just get out of here. And he gives them all kinds of stuff. And he says, go. And so we don't have any record of them having a conversation or a relationship until this moment. But now he hears Isaac's born. And God's profiting Abraham. And Abraham's doing extremely well because God's with him. And so he says, I got to hook up with this guy and and make some kind of an allegiance, but I can't trust him. (laughs) But God is certainly with him. So what's he say? We've got to make a covenant. We got to sit down and you got to promise me, you got to swear before God, this is like signing a contract. You know what I mean? You guys sign contracts? Any of you have a mortgage? You got a mortgage? Any of you renting a place? Are any of you listening? Are any of you alive today? Okay. You sign a contract. I'm going to take out a loan for a car or I'm going to, I'm going to go and rent, uh, uh, you know, and they, they, you know, I need... Two mo- I need two months deposit, I need a background check, I, you know, I need to search you, get up against the wall, you know, all that kind of stuff. <laughs> Violate your privacy. And you have to sign a contract. This is the way that they would sign a contract. They would cut a covenant, and it's always cutting a covenant. You ever heard about cutting a deal? This is where it comes from, cutting a covenant. They would take animals, m- take them, shed their blood, split them in half, put them on opposite sides, and they would walk through the center, and they would state the contract. This is the contract. And the inference is, if I violate this contract, 
I should be like one of these animals. Now, that's a pretty binding contract, wouldn't you say? I imagine if you're walking through the bloody carcasses of a couple of animals that you just slayed, you would think twice about lying, which is really what he's trying to get at. I can't trust you, but I want to trust you, and I think I need to because you're starting to get big enough where, like in Egypt, the Jews were so blessed by God that they become a threat to Pharaoh. And he's, you know, I got to do something about this. And Abimelech does a good thing. He's going to make a covenant. He's going to make a relationship. Egypt, what they did is they made them all slaves so that they couldn't rise up. So this is a good thing. And it came to pass at that time, Abimelech, oh, and Phicol. Phicol, by the way, means all mouth. <laughs> Big mouth. Or if you, if you reverse them, it's the mouth of all. So maybe he was a spokesman. Maybe he was a, I don't know, maybe he was a, uh... yeah, maybe he's like Andrew. <laughs> so he just did a ba ba ba. I mean, so maybe he was a, a senator or, or, you know, a congressperson. Anyway, but so he's all mouth. This guy's all mouth. So, and, and he's his bodyguard, essentially. He comes with him and he goes, uh, and came to pass that he comes and he's tying up these loose ends. Because in the past, they've had problems, but now he's got a son and his family's getting bigger. And he says, yeah, and I, and I brought my boy Fikol with me. Uh, I, I call him pie hole, but you can call him Fikol. <laughs> and Abraham said, I will swear. So he agrees to the covenant. And Abraham rebuked Abimelech. Now with the shoe's on the other foot. Abraham rebuked Abimelech because of the well of water which Abimelech's servants had seized. And Abimelech said, I do not know who has done this thing. You did not tell me, nor had I heard of it until today. So Abby comes and says, let's make a covenant. And he says, I don't want you to lie to me anymore. And he goes, good, I'm glad you're here. I'll be glad to do that. But you stole my well. What? What? You stole my well. Your people came and stole my well. I dug this well, and your people just moved in and took it. Now, I don't know if you know this area in Gerar, but it's the southernmost part of Israel. It's very deserty. I don't know if that's a word, but it's deserty. And so a well is like your life. Imagine if you didn't have water in your house. That's kind of a big deal. And imagine if you couldn't find it somewhere. If there was a convenience store down the street where you could get a bottle of water out of the fridge and it's nice and cold. Imagine you're out in the desert and there's no water. Well, that's the situation for Abraham and all of his household. He digs a well, which is not a small task, in the desert and makes sure that it's there and then somebody steals it. So he goes, you want to make a covenant with me? You don't want me to lie to you? Well, I'll tell you what, I don't want you stealing my stuff no more. He goes, well, I don't know anything about this. This is the first I've heard of it today. So Abraham is taking this chance, this opportunity, this conflict to really resolve things. He doesn't do the passive aggressive, yeah, sure, like you can't trust me. What about you? What do you mean, what about me? Well, you know. Like he doesn't do all the games. He just comes right out and says, listen, I'll be glad to make a covenant with you, but I have to trust you too and you can't steal my stuff. Now remember, he said you can have the land and anything you want and go out, but apparently some people use the king's name to get what they wanted. And the king had no idea about this. And actually, this well is still there today. Actually, there are probably seven of them in this area, and I'll show you why when we get there. So he digs this well, and a bunch of these guys just come around and say, no, you're not going to have it. And they kind of get rough with Abraham and his people. So he's got an opportunity to fix this. There's actually a good biblical model to be able to fix problems that you have with people. Matthew 18, you might be aware of it. How many of you know Matthew 18? Comes right after 17, right? <laughs> Moreover, if your brother sins, Jesus says, against you, go and tell him his fault between you and him alone. It's interesting, Abraham didn't go to him. He just sat on it. Might have bothered him too, but he didn't talk about it. And that's a problem when we have a problem with somebody and we don't discuss it, right? right. Go to him and tell him his fault between you and him alone. It doesn't say tell everyone, go on Facebook, doesn't say any of that. Tell him alone. If he hears you, you've gained your brother. And if he will not hear, 
take with you one or two more, that by the mouth of two or three witnesses, every word may be established. So you get a couple of witnesses in on it and you have an intervention. You say, hey, listen, you did this thing. You got to straighten out. You got to cut it out. Two or three witnesses. So now you've brought more pressure to bear. And if he refuses to hear them, let it to the church. Tell it to the church. But if he refuses even to hear the church, let him be to you as a heathen and a tax collector. How do you treat the tax collector? With grace, but I'm not going to, you know, I'm not going to pay more taxes than I have to. And somebody who's a heathen is somebody that uh, could rip you off blind. I mean, how do you treat a telemarketer? <laughs> Hi, how are you? No, no, I'm fine. I'm a phone service. Thank you very much. Why? <laughs> you're kind, you're nice, but I'm not going to give you any intimate details. And they always ask you for those details, don't they? They're trying to move in on you and make a fake relationship. But anyway, if they don't listen to you, it says, treat them like a heathen and a tax collector. So we need to do due diligence to repair relationships. And unfortunately, Abraham didn't do that. He just sat there boiling about it, being upset about it, maybe complaining, maybe muttering under his breath, maybe telling Isaac, don't go near that well. Those are bad people. He took my well. It says, assuredly, Jesus says, Assuredly, I say to you, whoever, whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. In other words, any decision that's made in a church setting about treating somebody like a heathen and a tax collector, know that God's got your back. That's essentially what it means. Again, I say to you that if two of you agree on earth concerning anything that they ask, it will be done for them by my Father in heaven. For where two or three are gathered together in my name, I am there in the midst of them. Isn't it interesting that that last passage is like the most common thing quoted at a prayer meeting? But in, in the context, it's about two people resolving a problem. And where there are two or three, like those two or three witnesses, wherever they are gathered, there I am. So the assurance is this. If, if you've got a problem and you go to deal with it, you prayerfully think about this and you go and you take care of it. Know that, number one, God's got your back. And number two... He's, he's there. Not only does he back you up in those decisions when you have to excommunicate somebody, but he's also there in your midst as you're trying to resolve these things. How many of you don't like conflict? I don't like conflict either, but it's part of my job. And I understand that the scripture says I should do these things, but I don't want to. I just don't want to. And it's mostly because I'm afraid of messing it up. I go to somebody that hurt me and say, you hurt me. And I could say anything after that. And I have to be careful that I don't revert into my fleshly nature, right? Because that's what we do when we get hurt. We tend to say things we don't mean and we'll be sorry for later. And I never, ever want to dishonor the Lord Jesus Christ by doing that. So that's what I hate about conflict is what could trigger inside of me caused me to go off like an atom bomb. So, we should be willing to confront in a timely manner. Don't be like Abraham, sit on your hands and let this thing go on for years, actually. Uh, we find out, because the next chapter, we're going to see uh, Isaac's 33 years old, and uh, this happens somewhere in there. So, don't sit on your hands if something like this happens. Go deal with it. Matthew 5, 23 to 23, 6. Therefore, if you bring your gift to the altar, or if you're coming to church, I'll give you the, the new twist, and you remember that your brother has something against you, leave your gift there before the altar and go your way. First, be reconciled to your brother, and then come and offer your gift. Agree with your adversary quickly while you are on the way with him, lest your adversary deliver you to the judge and the judge hand you over to the officer and you be thrown into prison. Jesus is saying, if you have a problem with somebody, that's more important than you showing up here on Sunday. And you should go deal with that. Before you come here and pretend to worship the Lord and, and enjoy the presence of God, enjoy what it is to have free conscience and what it is to be forgiven of your sin, you need to do the right thing and offload that garbage deal with it and resolve it. Make sense? Yeah. 
That can be hard on Sunday mornings because we have an enemy. Oh, okay. Some of you understand. Good. We have an enemy, and it, it just trying to get out of the house is difficult. And, it, and the more people you add, the, the harder it gets until you have an entire family, and you're like, oh, my goodness. Oh, we forgot this. We forgot that. And then you're, you're like a pack animal trying to leave the house, and you're like, oh, my goodness, we're going to be late. We're going to have to walk in front of everybody, and Pastor Dave's going to see us. He's going to give us that eye. We'll just sneak in the back. We'll be quiet. They won't. And then everybody sits down, and there you are standing. You know? <laughs> I know what that's like. We have to do what's right before God before we come into this place. We have to do what's right in our heart to resolve conflicts between people and turn the other cheek and go the second mile and just, we have to do that. There are loose ends that we carry around that we don't need to carry around. I've had people I've gone to and talked to and they're like, you're still so upset about that? <laughs> I forgot about that a long time ago. It's like, so I've been all twisted up thinking about this and you're over it already. What a jerk am I, huh? I sit and get all twisted up for no reason. We have an enemy, people, and quite often he looks just like you. <laughs> or like me. There's priority in preparation for worship. Preparing to come into this place, believe it or not, you share your joys and your sins with everybody. It affects your face. It affects your relationships. It affects every word you say. Preparation before worship is hugely important to make sure that our hands are clean and our, and our heart is free. In Genesis 26, we're going to see a little bit later that there were probably more than just the one well in Beersheba. It says here, then Isaac departed from there and he pitched his tent in the Valley of Gerar, which is where we're talking about, and he dwelt there. And Isaac dug again the wells, plural, of water in which he had dug in the days of Abraham his father, for the Philistines had stopped them up after the death of Abraham. And he called them by the names, plural, of which his father had called them. The thing is, it probably wasn't one. It probably seven of them. And the reason I think that is because moving forward, we're going to see. And Abraham took sheep and oxen, and he gave them to Abimelech. And the two of them made a covenant. And Abraham set seven ewe lambs of the flock by themselves. And then Abimelech asked Abraham, what is the meaning of these seven ewe lambs which you have set by, <laughs> set by themselves? So he sets seven lambs all by themselves and they do, their, they do their thing. They cut the covenant and there are witnesses and there's blood and it's all done. And there's very conspicuously seven ewe lambs that are over on the side. And he's like, what's that all about? What he's going to do is he's going to make a payment probably for seven wells. And he's going to make it representative. Even though they're his, he's going to pay for them so he owns them. He wants to take ownership of it. He doesn't want to just rent the land anymore. He wants to be a landowner. And this is the way that you do it. You make a trade. And so he's going to take these seven lambs. And it's interesting because of this, this sacrifice that he made is a picture of what's going to happen when Jesus Christ comes and the Lamb of God sheds his blood for the sins of the world. It's interesting how God has ordained all of those sacrifices to point to the ultimate sacrifice of Jesus Christ as he comes. And uh, the whole sacrificial system, once Moses comes and the temple's instituted. So he goes, gee, you got seven lambs over there. What's that all about? <laughs> it's a little like, hey, it's your birthday, and somebody walks in with a gift, and you go, hi, what do you got there? Is that for me? It's kind of like that. You would never say anything so obvious as that, would you? It's good to see you. What do you have there? Let me shake that. That's what he's saying. What do you, what do you have these animals here on the side for? And he said, you will take these seven ewe lambs from my hand. Uh, that's, a, that's a command, by the way. Have you noticed that? In other words, I, I'm not going to take no for an answer that they may be my witnesses that I have dug this well. He's got seven animals as witnesses. Therefore, be called, there, therefore, he called that place Beersheba because the two of them swore an oath there. 
Thus, they made a covenant at Beersheba. So Abimelech rose with Phicol and the commander of his army, and they returned to the land of the Philistines. By the way, that's a, that's a picture of the well as it stands today. And it's a place you can go to in the middle of the desert. If you like deserts, it's a good place to go to. Otherwise, I like the internet. <laughs> and so he says, these seven are a witness. In other words, they're going to be proof that this exchange was made. And notice, even though they're his wells, he's willing to pay for them. He wants to make darn sure that Abimelech knows that he's not trying to rip him off. He's not trying to take something from him. He's being gracious. And isn't that interesting? He's giving more than he really has to. Isn't that what God does for us, though? It's called grace. So, Beersheba, by the way, the name means the well of the oath or the well of seven. Uh, Sheba is one of those words which means oath or seven. And it just so happens he's got seven ewe lambs and there's probably seven wells. So it's the, the well of the oath or the well of the seven. And it's just this act of beneficent grace where he gives way more than he has to in payment for these wells so that it will be sure that he, everyone knows that he owns them. He's no longer renting. He's now purchased the title for the land. It's now his, along with the wells. That's what this transaction is. There's all kinds of things that happen in Beersheba. You'll, you'll notice that um, Isaac comes back, which, which I pulled and showed you. Um, you remember the story of Jacob and Esau. Jacob leaves this area and goes when he runs away. Like there are all these things that end up happening. So it's a hub at this point because there's water there and it's the middle of the desert. But this becomes part of the inheritance. And they always talk about from Dan to Beersheba as you read through the scripture. Dan is the ultimate north of Israel and Beersheba is the ultimate south before you go toward e um, Egypt. So that's why they always, it's, you know, from, from, you know, Alaska to Hawaii or whatever. And Abraham planted a tamarisk tree in Beersheba and there called on the name of the Lord, the everlasting God. And Abraham stayed in the land of the Philistine for many days. What a great opportunity it was for him to make peace with Abimelech. Now, he's not living with a guy who can't trust him. He's not living with, uh, you know, having to find water somewhere else because he's got his well back and he paid for it. And now he has peace with his neighbor. That's pretty cool, right? I see how God is firming up all these little loose ends in Abraham's life because he's got a kid now. And he's settling into the territory now. And you have to live at peace with the people that you're living with or that you're next to, right? You know what it's like to not have peace? It's miserable. And so God enabled this to happen. And Abimelech was the guy that insisted on it, right? You will make a covenant with me so that I know you won't lie to me. So he plants a tamarisk tree or a grove, actually. If you have the New King James, it says he plants a grove. It's actually a bunch of tamarisk trees. They're interesting trees. They're... Um, they're like cedar trees. They have these long feathery, you don't give a rip. Anyway, <laughs> long feathery uh, sort of evergreens that come. They tend to be very acidic. And so when the needles drop, what happens is it makes the, the sand very bad. But it's one of the only trees that will actually grow in salt water. It's an interesting thing. And I see the tree being a picture of Abraham. Here he is in the middle of the desert and God is blessing him in the middle of the desert like a tree that can live off of salt water. I just think it's emblematic for me. And it actually, when it blossoms, this is what it looks like. It has all these feathery, kind of like a butterfly bush sort of thing going on. And it's, uh, but it's a, a cedar tree. So he planted a tree, which is a symbol of putting down roots, right? I mean, unless you're on a mission trip and you're planting trees for the ecology and all of that, you plant a tree in your yard, right? Because it's your yard. I'm gonna plant a stinking tree in my yard if I want to. <laughs> And that's what it is. It's kind of a symbol of putting down roots. In fact, you'll always see Israel, a man lying under his fig tree or his, or, his, uh, or his vine. It's always a picture of peace. It's a picture of prosperity. It's a picture of settling in and growing roots in one place. Now, you're talking about a nomadic people planting, which is a emblematic in itself. And he calls on the everlasting God. If you know anything about Abraham, he's always making altars. 
he always makes an altar to God. Wherever he goes, he makes an altar. He, he calls out to God and he prays. He prays for his blessing, his direction, and all that. That's a good practice, isn't it? I wonder how it would be if every time you put your seatbelt on, you made that steering wheel an altar. Lord, help me as I go. Guide me, help me, protect me. I drive in Jersey. I wonder what would happen if every day you came home and every time you touched the doorknob, you prayed for your house and you prayed for as you enter that God would bless you to do that. If you made altars everywhere you went, because when you make an altar, you get altered. And just bring yourself before the Lord and say, direct me and guide me because my goodness, we need that, don't we? We certainly do. He calls on the Lord everlasting, which is O, which is El Olam. El Olam is one of the, the, the names of God. It's the everlasting one. Actually, if you, if you do a, a dig down on the word, it's, it's a description of the vanishing point be, where the sky meets the earth. That's Olam. It's, it's like the forever point. So that's why it gets the name everlasting God. He's the one who's far off and yet never so far off that he isn't right here with us. El Olam. And he worships. And worship means turn to kiss. Did you know that? One of the words for worship is to turn to kiss. That's what worship is. <laughs> you will, my sister. You will. My wife looks over at me with a giant smile, and when she does that, she has so much cheek that she has no eyes. And she does. You know what that means? I love you. That means I love you. That's what the word worship means. Turn to kiss. Now, as an exercise, no, I won't do that. You know, they have the kiss cam. You know, at these games, you, you go to a game and they have the kiss cam and they zoom in on you? Yeah, I won't do that. Anyway, so he stays there many days in the, in the land of the Philistines. So now all of his loose ends are tied up and everything is ready for the next chapter. The next chapter is going to be a blockbuster, guys. Don't miss this one. It's chapter 22, where God asks Abraham to do something unconscionable. And there's a reason, and we'll look at it. So what do you think about making oaths and swearing? I bet you you have a couple of oaths out there. I know I have a mortgage with the bank and I promised them I'd pay it back. I went before an altar 39 years ago and, and made a promise that this would be my only wife. So far she is. You know, nobody knows about tomorrow, but today I do. This is what Jesus teaches in the New Testament about oaths and swearing. First of all, don't do it haphazardly because people that do that all the time, you ever, you ever have that friend that tries to tell you something, you go, they go, no, no, swear to God, man, swear to God. Swear on my mother's grave. What is that bananas? You mean, if you're not saying that, that means you're lying to me, right? Is that what you're telling me? Of course that's what it means. Here's the thing. Matthew chapter five, verse 33. Jesus says, and again, you have heard that it was said of old, you shall not swear falsely, but shall perform your oaths to the Lord. By the way, that's a good policy. If you say you're going to do something, you should do it. If you say you're going to be somewhere, be there. If you say you're not going to do something, don't do it. This all makes sense. Right, Steve? <laughs> but I say to you, do not swear at all, neither by heaven, for it is God's throne, nor by the earth, for it is his footstool, nor by Jerusalem, for it is the city of the great king. These are all things people would swear by instead of, I swear to God, I swear in my mother's grave and all that kind of bananas. Nor shall you swear by your head, in other words, on your own reputation, because you cannot make one hair white or black without hair dye, but, <laughs> but let your yes be yes and your no be no, for whatever is more than these is from the evil one. If you have to make extra, totally, really, 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 really sure that somebody believes you, 
That says something about your character, doesn't it? So don't do that. Say yes or no and mean it every single time and do what you say you're going to do. Jesus said, there's one better than making a vow. Just don't make a lie to a guy named Abimelech so he doesn't trust you. It's the bottom line of this passage. James 5, 12 says something similar. But above all, my brethren, do not swear, either by heaven or by earth or, or by any other oath, but let your yes be yes and your no be no, lest you fall into judgment. Be careful of what you say. Some of us are very, very fast to make promises that we can't keep. Hey, why don't you come on over on Sunday after church? It'd be great. Let me check my calendar. Oh, I've done this seven times this week and there are seven different couples coming to my house today. <laughs> How did I do that? Well, I did that because I didn't check my calendar before I shot my mouth off. And we do that, don't we? Because our heart is that we want to help people, we want to do things for people, we want to love on people and show the love of Christ. And yet, there's only 24 hours in the day and you only have so much strength. Be careful that you don't overpromise and underdeliver, because what that is is a reflection on your relationship with God. It's a reflection on that. So keep your character. Don't swear at all, Jesus says. So that's Abimelech. Next week, come back while we talk about a human sacrifice of a father over his son, his son Isaac. It's a test of his faith, and we see that Abraham has a roller coaster ride of trusting and believing God and then completely failing and falling to the ground, much like you and I. As the worship team comes up, I'd like you to consider what it is the Lord would have you to do with this little piece of information about Abimelech. There may be a relationship that needs to be patched. There might be some business that you need to do some loose ends that need to get taken care of. I pray that the Lord would give you strength and be able to face that without sitting on your hands or without grumbling and complaining or without venting it in some other way, shape, or form, but deal with it and know that the Lord is with you and he has your back.